researchers who are hardcore know about all this, so you, you might as well have an overview of it, although you probably won't be using it for most applications, is, is this use, thing of user modeling. Okay. Now, the, 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 if you like, the holy grail of most scientific application is prediction, simulation and prediction. We want to be able to predict the environment, predict what will happen. Okay, that's why we have hypotheses, which predict what will happen and then we test them. Okay. But how can we do this in a, in a more sort of um, um, in a more well-found way, whereby we know what answers we should be getting? So, for instance, how do we? Why do we simulate the weather so that we can predict it? Why do we simulate um, oil flow through pipes so we can predict how fast and how much, etc.? Yeah. Why do we do any kind of scientific or climatological prediction or simulation so we can help to predict? And this is, the, this is something that we've been trying to do in usability in the day, so in fact it's for quite a while. And here we have the first sort of real model um, of, uh, and it's a very simplistic one, of ways that we can predict what people are going to do. So this one is called the human processor model. Okay? And it's all of these ones by, well mostly by Carl, by Carl, Moore, Moran and Newell. Okay? So this one, human processor model, there's a book, is this um, out there in the 80s? And the idea was we want to calculate task time based on what people were doing. Okay? How long would it take them to do certain things based on the interface? How long would the cognitive understanding task take of the actual person's brain? How long would it take for the information to be learnt, etc., etc.? Okay? And this is why we could, and this is what was created. Now here, it's generally lots of rules. So for instance, we have things like we have. Okay, so we have a processor, each processor has a cycle time, each memory has a decay time, for instance. So we model the human like they're a computer, because we have this idea of memory decay time, we have this idea of a, of a processor decay time. So the human processor aspect might be cognitive processor, visual processor, auditory processor, those kind of things. Okay? Now, it's not very good. It didn't really predict very much. Certainly, it's in no way as good as fixable. Okay, for pointing tasks, which we've already spoken about and seen, right? Okay, so then we come up with this other one. Oops. Then we come up with this Gomes model. Okay, so this Gomes model is also by the same people, comes very close to the same book, goals, operators, methods, and selection. Okay, so this is a different model to trying to understand better um, the human processing system. The reason why this occurred and why they were presented together is because this is work that occurred. This book is an amalgam over time. So generally, the book that was that was created was maybe represented, you know, five to ten years worth of work. So over that time, they started with the human processor model and it evolves to this goals, goals, operators, methods, and selections. Okay. Now this one, actually, because it has these 
idea is long operator methods to actually think, oh, there's some way of doing this. You know, this might be all right. We might be able to actually get something that's a bit more accurate. Okay. But again, not quite the case. So we move on to this: the keystroke level modeling. Keystroke level modeling is not is more accurate, but it's more constrained. Okay. So it's far more accurate than GOES, and it's far more accurate than the human processor model, but it's not, it, but it's far more constrained because it's, it, it, everything comes down to keyboard level work, okay? But it's measurable. The key here is it's measurable. So the thing with GOES is that it's far less measurable. Human operator, human <coughs> processor, uh, not, not very measurable at all. GOES, more measurable, but more constrained. KLM, uh, very constrained, okay? But measurable, more measurable. Now, out of this um, comes this thing, Cogtool. Okay, so Cogtool have been working on for years. Still not complete, but it actually works quite well. You can use it. You can download it, and you can use it. People do. Okay, so this is this Cogtool is over at well uh, CMU. So it's Carnegie Mellon. Yeah, and let's give you a quick example of what you might do with with a, with a Cogtool uh, experiment. Now, this one is nicely stolen from this example, from Richard. So this is John Richards. He works at um, IBM. I'm going to uh, pick an answer. He's a professor over in uh, D, but they're both in the uh, version of the to uh, DJ Watson. Um, this one is, was present, his work presented at a, at a conference that's called PPIC, <coughs> which is Psychology of Programming Conference. Okay, so it's called PPIC. Anyway, there we go. Um, and what you can see here is you've got a set of interfaces. So the first thing is you've got a set of interfaces and interactions. Now what does this look like to you here? From our work on, say, from our work we've already done, what does this kind of thing look like to you guys? What does it remind you of? What's the process we're having this in front of? Looks like a slideshow. Huh? Looks like a slideshow. Looks like a slideshow? Anything else? Interaction model between uh, where, uh, sort of where you're moving from one street, that's so what one closer, warmer, but not quite. So if we were talking about hat racks for understanding, our bit of discussion about uh, um, how we model stuff and how we uh, relate this stuff to software engineers. Wireframes. It looks like wireframes. It looks like a storyboard to me. Yeah. So this kind of thing looks like a storyboard. So therefore, you might think so right, so this is okay. If I've got a storyboard, I could dovetail that storyboard into this. With not much effort. So you've got these various screens that we've put out, and then we pick out on these screens various components, buttons, actions, things like this, and we then model them. We remodel the transition up here. It's a mouse, left button, double click. That's what's going to happen when you select this thing. Okay? When you select this thing here, this, when you select this square here, which will be a button or a link, it says you're going to use a mouse transition. Left mouse, double click, not single click, because double click take longer. Yeah. And then this thing here will be enacted. Okay, that will come up. Yeah. All you're doing is making the implicit, the obvious thing is explicit. Okay, then we actually get to see this keystroke uh, level modeling. So we can then see, um, for instance, at this frame, which is obviously, we drill down into the frame that we've just selected, that's going to happen. The highlighted step occurs at a certain point, okay, here. So this highlighted <coughs> step here occurs at a certain point within this particular um, part of the storyboard. And we can see here that it's the mouse hand is right, uh, it's a, a initial hand locations on the mouse, okay, and therefore we can model, the st we, can, we can then model more easily the steps that a user is taking through each frame, if you like, each interaction. Okay? Much like a storyboard approach. Yeah? Does that all make sense? Okay. Then what we get, when we, once we've done all this, is we get the ability to understand how long things take, how much time they'll take, how much time things will, <coughs> how much time it will take things to occur, and what's going on. So here it's saying things like you know, we've got a motor, a procedural call, a control call, okay? 
cognitive calls. So these things are going to be happening at the user end, if you like, because we already know, we've already got this keystroke level model of the user. And what we're trying to do is link this thing links the keystroke level model of the user with the interface and the interaction scenario. So you have to make explicit the interaction scenario you want to see, but we already have a model of the user, so therefore we can do things like how long things are going to take, what they, what's going to be presented, what should be presented, how could we make things less than, how could we modify this. You know, it allows us to say, well, if this takes seven seconds, we want to change that now in Contour, so it only takes four seconds. How do we do that? Allows you to answer these kind of questions. But they're very simplistic questions. They're much about point and click kind of questions, not overarching questions, really. But it's still quite good, I think, anyway. Okay? Um, so this kind of stuff you probably won't be doing for standard UX stuff because it's quite in-depth and you have to do something about it. You have to really you know, model it well. But you very well may be for certain aspects that use it. We'll be using this kind of stuff certainly at Boeing. Okay? Um, um, uh, they use it at NASA. Um, uh, American Air Force Academy, okay, this kind of stuff, where you're actually building interfaces for bespoke pieces of kit which are critical. Yeah? Yes? Uh, can one of the example, I mean, simplest example would be how many clicks it takes to get to, to perform a sort of end-to-end -end task? That's not, the, that's not what this is trying to show you. This is trying to say how long will it take for, the, for, that, for a user to get from one end of this interaction to the other end of the interaction, <coughs> and do they have some cognitive view. Oh. So, if it's about clicks, for instance, if it was only about clicks, I could put everything on the page and it could be everything be one click away. But how long will it take to find that one thing cognitively in the page? More time maybe than multiple clicks. So when we used to have this idea where we used to measure things in clicks, and we say everything's only one click or two clicks away, that, that doesn't make any account for a complex interface which you have to then cognitively navigate. You still have to do something. This new idea of progressive disclosure, where we have multiple, we're not so bothered about the number of clicks, but we just bother about how logically things fit together. So it is based on these kind of experiments that we can see that multiple clicks, which are nicely presented with less complex information, allow us a faster, <coughs> a faster usability time, a faster interaction time, time to task completion time, than um, things like um, clicks, number of clicks. Because you have to sit there looking at the looking. Yeah? Okay. Uh, okay. So we can see how this all nicely fits together. Yeah? Okay. Coffee time. Oh, just kidding. No. Um, okay, so as I said before, I'm not going to spend too much time on this because I'm conscious I want to get on to the real uh, rules. Um, or well, the real principles that I'll be bothered about, that we're going to be bothered about. Here, there are plenty of usability principles, okay? Plenty. Yeah? And so all I've gone through is looked for different kinds of usability principles in the nature of finding uh, page 158. So, you'll, so I've been through and looked for lots of different usability principles from all the general big experts, the names that you might see, and I say standards and this kind of stuff, and I've collated them together so you can see where they fit. <coughs> and then, there's a rationale for why I'm chucking ones away, or I'm keeping ones, or I'm amalgamating ones, or I'm calling it something different. Yeah? Under this. I'm not, I don't propose to get into that right now, because we haven't got the time, and to be honest, it's not that interesting. Yeah? This is just for you guys, so that you know when you uh, go to uh, a company, and they say, oh, Ben Schneiderman's eight golden rules. Hey, go to collated principles. Yeah? And have a look at that and say, oh yeah, hmm, Ben Schneiderman. Error handling, we need to make error handling simple. That's the same as ISO, isn't it? Then normal. Put Nelson normal. Don normal. Yeah? Okay? So, this is the kind of stuff we're looking at. Well, we can see that we go on. So, we've got ones here for safety and shortcuts and simplicity and all this kind of stuff. They're just a collated set of principles which you might find useful. And these are the sources of those indeed of those principles so that you can go and grab these sources if you ever need to. So if somebody wants to say, oh tell me about, you know, we're using Ben Schneiderman stuff, well you just go to the first one in the list. We're using Don Norman stuff, you go to the third one in the list. 
Yeah, and, and read it. Yeah? Okay. Well, this is how these principles fit together. And you see, there's nothing that new. They're all overlapping. Massively overlapped. Yeah? <coughs> so, I have my own set of potted principles which, I've, which have evolved from the, these um, correlation, from the um, correlated potted principles. Okay? So these are the principles that I think we ought to be thinking about for better efficient user experience. Okay? Okay, so some of these are reasonably straightforward, yeah? which I'm not going to get into directly because I think they're reasonably obvious. We'll just do a little light overview of these. Some of them they won't have seen before, and they don't really appear in that many uh, overviews of <coughs> usability. Uh, so the first thing, stability. Okay, So are the interactions stable? Well, do things fall over? Do things do what you think they should do? Are you able to recover from unstable aspects of the system? Now, I'm putting this into usability because, yes, okay, so you're going, it's got, things are going to be less usable. The task completion time is going to be worse if the system isn't stable. But really, you could put stability into some kind into development with robustness, which also is in there. Um, you, could, you could put that into um, um, principles of development, UX development, so with agile, you could have uh, stability. Yeah? Because it's really a part of the whole system that if your system isn't stable, you're not doing a very good job as a software engineer for start. Okay. Really, it needs to be reasonably stable. <coughs> Scalability. So this is a this is a key one. Oftentimes, does the interface and its data scale? Okay. So that's 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 a couple of questions. So first of all, it might be that you have we just did some work whereby they started off with small sets of data, small data sets. But you'll be getting the uh, report we gave them, which um, is a system called an Apple Box, um, as, part of the, um, as part of some of the notes of the, part of the appendix so you can see what we actually said. But their data sets, they, had to, they start off with a small amount, a small set of data, and they didn't want to display it in tables because tables are, don't look that good. They started to display them in nice JavaScript looking you know, uh, pop ups. <coughs> so like thought bubbles actually, okay? So they look quite cool when there's three or four. But when it scales up to thirty-six thousand, then it's just a load of bubbles all down the screen, and you can't do much with it, and it doesn't sort, etc. So the easy, so the way to make it scale is to put it back into a table. So therefore, you could have flexibility if you wanted to. You could say up to ten, we have this nice bubbly system which looks cool. But once we get to more than ten data sets, we put it into a table so you can easily see it. Now it might be that you only want to see it in a table. Yeah? But that's the kind of thing, does the, does the data scale in the interface itself or doesn't it? Okay? The second thing is, does the system scale as well in total? Because obviously that's an interface, that's an interface um, question because it affects task completion time. <coughs> yeah? And sometimes this won't be the case. For instance, um, there used to be a shop, an online shop, 10 years ago. No idea what it was called, but it used to sell clothes. And they had the best servers and they had the best development platform and they made their excellent system. They demonstrated it to their um, to their uh, managers and they loved it. Okay, and then they put it out and it didn't scale because as soon as it had to do any kind of up and down with a telephone wire, which at that time it did, any time it had to send any data, there was so much of it that it was just grindingly slow. It took 40 minutes for a page down. <coughs> So it looked really pretty when it got there, but I'm not waiting, not for 40 seconds, it took 40 seconds for a page down there, so I'm not waiting 40 seconds for one page down there, it's just not going to happen. So the, the whole company was based on this internet phenomenon, and went bust, because they couldn't sell enough product, because nobody would wait for 40 seconds for a download. Why would you? Because the developers hadn't checked whether, they could, whether it would scale, and because the developers and the user, user experience people hadn't checked how long people would wait, for a downplay to occur, what was the cost benefit of this to them? Okay, none of that had been checked. Okay, simplicity. Well, we've been through simplicity with the uh, style user face, so I think that's reasonable. Um, <coughs> situational awareness. So it says up here is the perception of the interface um, facilitate decision to, to, to facilitate decision making, really. So, Anybody else want to tell me about situational awareness? Has anybody heard of situational awareness as a term before? 
Yes, I had it in the, I sort of heard it in the corporate communication meetings, what your situa situational awareness is, picking up those pointers, whether whether your message is getting across to them or not, just picking up those pointers, whether they're nodding or not doing <coughs> about that. Yeah, that's one, one area. Any other areas that we've heard of situational awareness? No? So it's, it's used all the time in, um, in um, aircraft, in flying. It's used all the time. Situational awareness is used massively. Because you need to, you've got lots of cognitive and difficult tasks occurring all at the same time. You need to know what the situation is, what you're, what's happening with the plane, what's happening with the fuel loads, what's happening with the area around you, what's happening with the communication. Okay. And so you need systems that allow you to understand the situational awareness. Now, you won't find situational awareness in any of the um, principles that from Schneider and the like. It's one that I think is important based on my research. Okay? So you might want to put a line through this in your notes now, saying it's Harper's egocentric weirdness and forget about it. But I would suggest that when you're building something, what you're trying to do, and it's very difficult <coughs> to test, is enhance the, the user's situational awareness. You're trying to allow them to understand the situation that they're in, the context that they're in. Where are they in a the, in the, in the path? For instance, I would argue that, um, say in Amazon, there's a little there's a little bar in Amazon which is which is the shopping cart progress. That allows you to understand something about the situation that you're in, where you are, are you have you paid, are you going to pay, have you placed the order yet, what's in the basket. This kind of little thing is very simple, but it allows us to understand our situation more easily. But this is very very important for those of you who will be going on to work at large safety critical. Um, system, in large safety critical systems where users are in the mix. Okay? You need them to understand the situation and where their situation, you're aware of that situation. Yeah? Okay. Self description. <coughs> so, this is another one which is kind of hinted at. So, where do we do self description already? In, in, where do you guys already do self description? Yes? In my documentation first code. In documentation for code, so you guys have generated Java docs, haven't you? Yeah? And so Java doc can only work if you've self-described the code as you go through. What other kind of, I mean, this self-description, what other kind of ways um, have been proposed for really self-description by other illustrious figures in computer science? Or a specific illustrious figure in computer science? Anybody heard of literate programming? Okay, anybody heard of uh, NUTH? The art of computer programming? Bloody hell, I so. Grief. <laughs> okay, so um, he proposed this system and he wrote LaTeX, of course, uh, etc. And um, he proposed a <coughs> system of literate programming where we write the programs more in a more literary style. Okay, so everything is self described. The program is its own documentation, if you like. So this is more difficult to do with the interfaces without them get, sort of getting bulky. But what you can you do is use metaphor. You can use understanding from the real world to help implicitly self-describe what's going to happen. Yeah. This is very it's it's very tricky though this self-description. I mean, I mean the reason why we all resort, resort to documentation is because self-description is very tricky when it comes to interaction design. Yeah. Even the simplest product is <coughs> a sheet of paper with something on it normally <coughs> just to get you going. But you might want to think about this in much more detail. Okay, new one, um, which is, is not only usability, actually, but it's only really been, um, if you like, in vogue for the last few years, is this um, progressive disclosure. As we were talking about before, um, everybody likes this click time, num number of clicks away used to be the, the way we measure things. The, the, less cl the least clicks away, the better. But that doesn't work for complex systems, okay, because they're complex, and everything will be on the screen at the same time, and you'll have no situational awareness. Yeah. All, if all tasks are happening together, then you also might be able to self-describe it. Because yeah, they're all presented at the same time in one thing. So, we have this progressive disclosure whereby you can, you can describe a system by what comes after it, by this hierarchy of interacting, interaction. What does this say, progressive disclosure aspect and um, um, self-description, in some ways, what do they negate? What might they negate that we've talked about before? What behaviour might they negate that you might want to see from the system? Yes. Emergent behaviour. Emergent behaviour. 
Because you're already predicting what people want to do and you're putting it into pathways for them. But how do you know that really is the case? How do you know, and, and if that is the case for some of the people you've tested, how do you know there's not a bigger emergent behaviour coming? Because, it's, because you need some level of unstructured, some level of yeah, unstructured um, interaction to understand what the emergent aspects are. Yes? But how, how, how exactly does self description aggressive disclosure negate this emergent behaviour? Okay, because, like, for instance, to, so progressive disclosure means that <coughs> you put things in a hierarchy, if you like, of interaction. So you might describe three things to start with. And then you might expand, when you click on that task, you expand out and expand out into more complicated or more specialised tasks as you go along. Which means that if you've placed them into a hierarchy that's reasonably fixed, you can't see the emergence of people doing things in a different way because they might have different hierarchies or pathways to you. Yeah? And even, and, and you, we can't test everybody. So that's the way that we might have a problem with the emergence aspect of it. Now, in the real world, this is writ large, for instance, the, the MIT building that was built in the um, early 90s, early 1990s, was built without any pathways to it. Okay? So it was just a big old building sat there, then a main computer block, and in, the, in this big grassy area. <coughs> so have anybody been to MIT? Or, no? okay. Well, anyway, what they did was they waited over winter and then concreted where the trails were. So that's the pathway. Yeah? So they didn't, they didn't say, you're going to go on these paths and put nice bushes here. They said, where do people walk? Concrete areas. Done. Emerging behavior. Yeah? Okay. So, familiarity is your system intuitive. Why do we put intuitive in little quotes? Why do we put intuitive in little quotes? Yes, the It's subjective. Sorry. Yes, and, and what does Jeff Rasmussen say about that? Yes? The, it's not really intuitive, it's just like familiar. It's just familiarity, yeah. So, in, uh, so you, you've got this idea that things are intuitive, they might not be to everybody, uh, and it's really about familiarity and social conditioning oftentimes. So therefore, my, what might be familiar, what might be intuitive to me here in this social situation? may not be familiar to lots of other people in other social situations, and especially when we've got global software, and global reach, that might not be the case. Yeah. Certainly, you know, what I think is intuitive is probably not a very good indicator of being a computer scientist, and also, again, you know, somebody with three uh, uh, bizarrely combinatorial knives. Um, those things don't make me necessarily a very good judge of this intuitive behaviour. So it's about familiarity. <coughs> so to do these kind of things, we need to maybe become familiar not just with, with different sections of, the, of, of our society that we're building for a certain population, for, for, for entire populations. Okay. Okay. Learnability. Are the interactions easy to learn? Well, consistency comes into this because obviously things that are consistent are obviously naturally more easy to learn. Things that are familiar are more easy to learn. Okay? But aspects of learnability are often difficult to test. How are we going to test learnability? How might we test learnability? You'd have to like, be able to know where they're going from. You might. Yeah, you, could, you might want to know when they're going wrong, you might have to know when you're going wrong. Yeah? Anyway, but say if, you want to, say if you're only thinking about time to task, task completion time. Yes? Maybe you can get someone who's like not involved in that procedure directly in that task and get them to perform the task and see whether, uh, how long it takes them to actually become accustomed to what they have to do on the extension basically. Yeah. As an indication. Okay. So that's, yes? Um, the task completion time should go dramatically down like, after the first time because they'll have already learned how to do it for the second yes. time and just do it straight away. Yes, so that, that, that's exactly right. That generally, we'd, we'd run somebody through the same, we'd get them th to do a task multiple times and see whether the task and see whether the task completion time is different. And if it isn't different, they're not learning much. Unless it's very short initially and therefore we've got familiarity and we've <coughs> learned it. 
If it's taken in the same time and that time is reasonably high, we think it's probably beyond what we would associate with familiarity saying, then there's a problem. If they're not learning, it's still as complex over time. Yeah? Okay. Um, robustness. Yeah, I'm not going to bother with this again because we've already talked about it, so we're just talking about how the system is robust um, and whether it's going to fall down in error. And again, I think this is probably a good, I think this is a good place to have this either. I think it's better than the uh, accessibility uh, one, but I think this really ought to be in some kind of development, um, generalised principles. Um, okay, so how do I remember this? You must remember it. However you like. I remember it like that. <laughs> um, so you can remember these, these principles as you wish. Now, I want to impress on you that in this exam and in this course, these principles that I'm teaching you are the ones that I think are right. Okay? I'm going to examine you on the principles that I think are right. But, in the real world, where they don't have the benefit of my extreme insight into the usability, they might not think this is the case. Okay? They might want to just use some of these other potter principles that are just off the shelf. Okay? So it's up to you to decide or to know these things in your outside work. But in this rarefied atmosphere, in this ivory tower of academia, where I am um, getting the king, this thing here is what, I'm, is what I think to be correct. Okay? Now in the notes, it should tell you why I think it's correct. And, you can, and you're free to disagree with me as much as you like. Okay? Especially in the real world, you might have different views, these things are okay? okay. Now, we've got a set of questions which I don't propose to go through completely. Okay? You should be able to see these again, like we did the accessibility ones, you should be able to see these writ. Uh, in the notes, and you should also be able to see that they that there's some underlying principles that um, justifications that go ahead of them. Yeah. I just want to look at the ones that I think are a bit more that you won't find in conventional literature, if you like, ones that are just sitting there. So stability, scalability, simplicity are all there. Okay. Situational awareness, one we've spoken about. So this kind of thing is reasonably important. So does your system facilitate orientation within the interface? and within the interaction. So what do I mean by this orientation within the interface and interaction? Orientation is kind of a property of awareness. So where are you looking? Where's your locus of attention being drawn? You know, Jeff Raskin's idea of this locus of attention, in computers we only have one area where we're, that we're attending to. Even though in the real world we can do many in computers, we seem to be very focused on one specific area. So what we want to do is naturally draw people's attention to areas of importance. Yeah? That's what headings are for in the notes. That's what images are for in the notes. Yeah? So that's what we need to think about. They're signposts, if you like. So that allows us to orient ourselves within the actual interface, and then we need to orient ourselves within the interaction, just like we spoke about with, say, Amazon, whereby we can see the shopping cart progress, for instance. Or other kinds of uh, purchase systems where we can see how far we're along in the information we give. Now, we'll also see how this can be leveraged when we go to this concept, this thing called, has anybody heard of gamification or phonology? Okay, well, in a couple of weeks we're going to be doing gamification and phonology. And, yes. It, um, and uh, we, can, we can then see how these things like this orientation within, to, within the interaction could be kind of um, used as part of gamification because it allows us to request more information for a user profile. So for instance, I, I went on to SlideShare and it says my user profile is 87% complete. 13% is the really juicy information I'm not going to give them because then they're going to try and sell something to me. But they want me. So they say, oh everybody, all your friends are 100% complete. You're at 87% complete. So you should be 100% complete and give us all your data. That's, that's the way that this gamified thing is used because you're, com you're competing against your friends who've already completed everything and they're great. Okay? So this is this kind of uh, orientation within the interaction. Okay. Um, is orientation and navigation around and through the system easy enough? Uh, is the error handling sim simple and is feedback informative? So 
We don't want super complicated errors. Okay? We don't want <coughs> uninformative feedback that talks that uses computer jargon. jargon. We want all these things to be in user jargon. And one way to do this is to have all of the information in, you know, <coughs> if we internationalize from the start, then we've got lots of different ways of describing the strings. Okay, that, that give us feedback and error handling. Yes? We know about internationalization and the way that we do internationalization. Yes, so we have this, so we have all these um, different different ways of describing things to us. It's not hard-coded into the system. That being the case, it's a good idea to do this because that way you can change the feedback terminology and you can change the, hand, the error handling terminology as the system um, evolves, as it gets deployed. So that people say, I don't understand what that means. Right, well, change it. What do you understand? What's the jargon you understand? That's better. Yeah? It's the way we'll see in our phonology section, the way that we, uh, the way that, say, for instance, the cash point suddenly changes to talking, to giving you its output in the rhyming slang, if you're in London. <coughs> but there we are. Yeah? Okay. Are all com components needed for this particular interaction visible? If they're not visible, you need to you need to signpost them. It's called preview. You need to give them some idea of preview, yeah, of where we're going. If you've only got a narrow preview, okay. um, you can see this kind of behaviour being incomplete on web pages, whereby you see that the click through is only a couple of milliseconds long on the second one. So if somebody clicks a link or clicks or executes something, and then immediately they return. The reason is they haven't got enough preview. They don't know what's going to happen. They don't know where they're going because it's not signposted to them. Yeah? So they have to go there, see this isn't the right place, and go back again and try the next. Yeah? Okay. Self description, reasonably straightforward. Aggressive disclosure, something that you need to think about, which I think is very important, is does the interface look overly complex? Okay, so to you, does it look overly complex? When I, when I when I open, say, something like Microsoft Word, to me it looks reasonably complex. To most users who aren't computer literate, it looks reasonably complex. Yet, what do we notice about all this st stuff on the um, iPad or an Android tablet? They've stripped away lots of the stuff. It's all ready to be progressively disclosed, but it's not all there because they haven't got the screen real estate. Yeah? So they've, they've progressively disclosed it specifically. So if you look at... Um, Apple Pages, it's far more complicated looking on, um, on, on Mac than it is on an iPad, but it has exactly the same functionality. Okay? So, because they realise that they think that an iPad, something that you, know, you need to get into quick, consumers are going to have it immediately, they don't want to, they want to know how to learn it, they just want to understand it. Yeah? They want to be familiar with <coughs> it. Well, they don't do that. They don't want the same in the same way for the for the Mac interface, yeah. because it's just driving with us. Okay. Right. Progressive disclosure, I think we're okay with. Familiarity, reliability, consistency. We're okay with all of these. Again, field trip next week. Okay. Yeah. We all know what we're doing. Um, these will be on the website today or tomorrow. I can. Okay. Any questions you've got for me? Remember, next week we may have cocktails. We may not. Okay. Depending on what I feel like. I'm in a good mood at the gallery and I'm feeling cool. And, uh, <laughs> uh, okay. So you need to uh, you can pop this on the page one seventy one. You need to read, read your notes up to the self-assessment questions at the end of the page one seventy one. Yeah, this week. Remember to have a look through at the um, stuff on emotional and aesthetic stuff yeah, in preparation for next week's lecture, which is down there. Yeah. Okay, if you want to see me, come there now or office open hours. Yeah.
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. 